Hello again. Welcome to lecture uh, 12, and this is part two on how vaccines work. So in the first lecture, I talked about the vaccines that are, that are currently in clinical trials or in anim being tested in animal models for SARS coronavirus 2. But I thought I'd spend some more time talking about the difference between the kinds of vaccines. What's the mechanism and what are the advantages and disadvantages of using each kind of vaccine? And I'm going to spend uh, most of the time talking about a review from Ewan Calloway that was published in Nature, uh, where he talks about the different kinds of vaccines and how sick groups have already begun injecting formulations into volunteers in safety trials. So this is a recap on how we develop immunity. I've talked about this multiple times, but one more time. The body's adaptive immune system can learn to recognize new invading pathogens, and we've talked about how SARS coronavirus does this. So it uses its spike protein on the surface to enter a susceptible cell. Typically, it should be a lung cell because the first exposure is in the lungs. It enters through the ACE2 receptor. It uncoats and releases its RNA. The RNA can then be transcribed into individual proteins. The proteins then reassemble to form new infectious viruses, and these new infectious viruses then get released. So an infectious virus can then be ingested by an antigen-presenting cell, and we talked about that on my lecture on um, uh, B cells and immune response. So the antigen-presenting cell chews up this virus and presents very small portions of viral peptides on the surface of molecules known as MHC molecules or HLA molecules, and these uh, HLA molecules that present the viral peptides attract different kinds of cells. One type of cell that it attracts is a T helper cell, and the T helper cell then gets activated, then activates B cells, and these B cells secrete antibodies. The antibodies can bind an infectious virus and eliminate it from the body. The T helper cell can also activate the cytotoxic T cells, and cytotoxic T cells then can recognize virally infected cell and destroy a virally infected cell. And eventually, you want to have long-lived memory B and T cells that recognize this virus. And these long-lived memory B and T cells patrol the body for months or years, providing immunity. And the goal of every vaccine is to develop long-lived T and B cell immunity. So whether it's RNA, DNA, live virus, um, subunit vaccine, every vaccine's end goal is to produce long-lived, robust uh, adaptive immunity. The first type of virus vaccine that I'd like to discuss is the live attenuated vaccine. So an attenuated vaccine really is a weakened virus, and typically this is how it's weakened. So you take the infectious pathogenic virus and then you passage it several times um, either in animal cells or human cells or in animals until it picks up mutations that make it less pathogenic and more attenuated. So uh, a live attenuated vaccine really is a vaccine virus. It behaves exactly like the virus. It goes into, when administered, goes into cells, it replicates, and just as I showed you in the previous slide, it produces new proteins, more infectious viruses, but these viruses are highly attenuated. We have very many effective live attenuated vaccines. Uh, these include uh, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, the chicken pox vaccine, uh, BCG, which is given to uh, many people in Asia, yellow fever vaccine, and um, the disease that I study, which is dengue or dengue hemorrhagic fever, the dengue vaccine is also, uh, in clinical trials, it is a live attenuated vaccine. So the advantages is it's very effective. It behaves like a virus, so it can induce very strong immunity, which is what you want. The disadvantages are it takes a long time to uh, passage these viruses to make them attenuated, to purify the viruses, to make sure that you have effective uh, viruses that do not produce disease. So the safety signal, it takes years in some cases to make sure that the live attenuated vaccine is not pathogenic. However, if you get to that state, it is highly effective. So another kind of vaccine is an inactivated virus vaccine. So here, basically, you have the pathogenic virus, but you treat it. 
So you treat it typically with, say, a chemical sometimes, such as formalin. Uh, in some cases, you might heat and activate it. So this is has all the immunogenic components on the surface that can trigger the immune system. However, when you inject it, because you made it inactivated, this vaccine cannot replicate. So unlike the live attenuated vaccine that comes in, replicates, produce more, produces more of itself, the inactivated vaccine cannot do it. So while it's much safer, you have to start with large quantities of infectious virus to generate an immune response. And once it gets in uh, into the cells, they don't really produce more copies of itself. So you want to have that initial bolus be really strong. And there are examples of many inactivated vaccines that work well. So examples of that include the DPT vaccine, tetanus toxoid, which we get, say, boosters every five to 10 years, hepatitis B. So here you pretty much have to get at least a booster shot or something to help aid uh, this inactive vaccine and generate a strong immune response. In some cases, you might add an adjuvant to help it be a more robust vaccine. So these are the main differences between live attenuated and inactivated vaccines. The next kind of vaccine that I'd like to talk about is the nucleic acid vaccines. So nucleic acid vaccines in general can be of two types, a DNA vaccine or an RNA vaccine. So both DNA and RNA vaccines have advantages in terms of being very safe and easy to develop. Uh, they only involve containing the genetic material. So in the case of a DNA vaccine, this contains the genetic material for only one portion of the coronavirus. So the spike gene, uh, that is the gene that's very immune. That's the gene that encodes for protein that uh, is important for cell entry and is also the target for long-term immunity. So the challenges of the DNA vaccine are uh, the ability to get the vaccine into a cell. Uh, uh, researchers have spent years uh, working on this process called electroporation, which really creates pores in the membranes of cells so that this DNA vaccine can be taken up easily. Once it's taken up, a DNA vaccine then will get translated into messenger RNA. The messenger RNA will form proteins. And in this case, it's forming more of the spike protein. And the spike protein then uh, gets chewed up by an antigen presenting cell. And as, as I mentioned in two slides, uh, I think two slides ago, these viral proteins are going to be taken up and then help initiate an immune response. An RNA vaccine uh, contains only the RNA uh, based on the sequence of the virus. So in this case, it would contain the RNA that encodes for the spike uh, protein. The RNA is typically, I think, en encapsulated in a lipid coat. And this helps uh, the RNA vaccine enter a cell again. So it enters by fusing with the cell membrane. The RNA gets in, you make viral proteins. The viral proteins similarly get then chewed up, presented, and initiate an immune response. So on the face of it, this looks uh, fairly simple. The big advantages are it's not a virus. So you don't have to spend these years in terms of trying to make a virus. You don't have to use cell culture systems to produce large quantities of virus or animal models to uh, test these um, viral vectors. Instead, you have just either the genetic material, so which could be either DNA or the RNA. So some of the disadvantages are it's not really clear how strong and of an immune response both DNA vaccines and RNA vaccines uh, can elicit. And that's the ultimate goal. We know they're safe, but are they as immunogenic? Uh, so they're not proven yet. So that's the big that's the big test up. There are no licensed vaccines for either that are based on either DNA vaccine module, module or an RNA vaccine module. So we are waiting to see that. There's a lot of hope that this will be a path forward, but uh, this is still uh, to be determined. And this is, we are in clinical trials now. We um, are likely to get uh, immunogenicity data from these clinical trials in the next several months. So we're waiting to see how immunogenic they are. Next really is how long will this immunogenicity last? We don't know that. And the hope is they would last a fairly long time. 
So the final two types of vaccines for SARS coronavirus that I'd like to talk about are viral vector-based vaccines and protein-based vaccines. There are several groups working on both uh, kinds of vaccines. So viral vector basically is you use another virus. Um, so an example is you either use a measles virus or adenovirus, and this virus is genetically engineered so that it can produce uh, the protein of interest. And in this case, we are interested in the SARS coronavirus spike gene. So really, it's, um, it's another virus presenting some portion of the coronavirus uh, gene of interest. So uh, akin to, say, uh, live attenuated vaccines, this is also an attenuated vaccine, but it's a weakened, um, for example, measles vaccine. And there's examples of uh, newly approved, say, Ebola vaccines that are viral vector based. So these enter when they're injected into, uh, the, into the body, come into the cell, they replicate, but really it's not a SARS coronavirus that's replicating, it's whatever the vector is. So it might be, say, a measles vector or an adenovirus-based vector that's presenting then the SARS genome. So you have this other attenuated virus that comes in, it replicates, it presents peptides, it initiates an immune response. But some of the concerns really are, you already, say, for example, have immunity to measles because you were immune or you got a measles vaccine when you were a child. So if you all have antibodies to measles, what happens is when you inject this virus into a cell and when it replicates, those antibodies can actually block the measles portion. So it blocks the vector, not the coronavirus part. It blocks the vector and it might diminish immunity. So there's those things to be considered when you have a viral vector vaccine because the vector-based immunity can be as strong. So there are examples also of non-replicating viral vectors. They also have an advantage because they're not replicating, but they have uh, a disadvantage because I don't think uh, they've been shown to produce long-lasting, robust immunity. So you might need, say, a booster shot or an adjuvant uh, in a non-replicating viral vector vaccine. So the last group that I'm just going to talk about are the protein-based vaccines. Here, basically, you make the protein of interest. So you're making spike protein or M protein uh, in, in the lab in vitro, and you're using these proteins, and they're injected into the cell, the cell. And you've got to get that protein effectively into the cell, the protein that gets chewed up, and then you, know, you can then present it on APCs, and then you initiate a response. But here in this case, what happens is it's not replicating. So again, the disadvantage here might be that you might need an adjuvant, you might need other stimulating molecules to help boost the immune system because this is not as, um, say, robust in terms of inducing a good immune response. But people are working on all kinds of um, added um, adjuvants or co-stimulatory molecules that can help uh, generate an immune response to the protein of interest. And virus-like particles. So basically, these are empty shells that mimic the coronavirus. They don't have the inner genome of the virus. So these cannot replicate, but they present as a virus because they have the surface properties of the virus. These are called virus-like particles. So virus-like particles are, are, are getting um, interest in terms of being an effective um, uh, vaccine. However, they're not infectious because they don't have any genetic material. So they can't replicate and form new forms of VLP. Uh, and the uh, manufacturing process for VLPs is a little bit, can be uh, significant. So while they mimic a virus, they are not infectious and it might be more difficult to manufacture. So there are many kinds of vaccines, each of which have some advantages and disadvantages. I hope that I was able to explain a little bit um, more clearly for you to understand the difference between all of the vaccines that are in trials now, how challenging they are. Uh, having said that, we have sped the process up so much, uh, it's, it's very likely that we will have an effective vaccine in the next year or so. So thanks again for your attention. This is Anuja Matthew, and this is part two on vaccines against COVID. Thank you.